Well, hi everybody. Welcome to the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad and the Chicago and Northwestern Railway in Wyoming. Today is February 3rd, 2023. This is layout update number 39. I'm Mark Pruitt, motorman on the Casper to Lander Doodlebug. Well, obviously I made it through my surgery, but I am still recovering. Even so, I did manage to do some light work on the layout, and I started building a fleet of beet hoppers for Holly Sugar. I think by the middle of this month, I should be back up to full steam. I want to say welcome and thank you to the channel's newest patrons, GM Pullman and Charlie. Let's take a look at what little bit I did get done in the layout room this month. In my last update, the layout reached this point, track being laid at the east end of Basin. On January 3rd and 4th, I extended the roadbed out the west end of Basin and into Himes Curve at 28 inch radius, the tightest mainline curve on the layout. I began figuring out turnout locations on the west end of Basin and wired in the mainline track. By mid-afternoon on the 4th, I had the mainline laid through Basin and the west turnout was in place. So, of course, I had to record the first train rolling into Basin. Since I was scheduled for surgery the next day, I tried to get any moderately heavy work done beforehand since I wouldn't be able to do it for a while after the surgery. I had the surgery as scheduled on the 5th and I guess it went well. I lived through it, but it left me feeling a little bit like Humpty Dumpty after he fell off the wall. I was in the hospital for two days, making it home the afternoon of Saturday, January 7th. I didn't think I'd be able to navigate the basement stairs for a few weeks, so I was pleasantly surprised to find that my legs were strong and steady. The rest of me felt like I might come apart at the seams, but not my legs. On Sunday the 8th, I very carefully made my way down the basement stairs to the train room. I'd left a doodle bug and trailer in Hudson the week before the surgery, so I turned on the layout, grabbed my TCS UWT50 Wi-Fi throttle, and ran the train back down to Casper. The 15 minutes or so it took to do this really bolstered my morale. It also used up all my energy for the day, so I made my way back upstairs and went to bed. A couple days later, I carefully descended the stairs again and spent about 15 minutes installing the ground throw at the east switch in Basin. Once again, 15 minutes was about all I had stamina for. The next day, I was back in the basement again, this time installing the west switch ground throw. 15 minutes a day seemed to define the amount of time I could stand for about a week or so. Back in early November, I ordered 10 of these AccuRail hoppers to be used in beat service. The problem was all 10 of the cars had this same road number, so I also ordered a set of AccuRail's renumbering decals. The car kits have been sitting in the train room for over a month, and since I didn't have the stamina to stand at the layout for very long, I figured I could start on renumbering these cars. After all, I should be able to sit at the workbench. On the 12th, I dug out the first car, cut the numbers off the decal sheet, and applied them. That seemed to work okay, except the decals broke into small pieces when I went to put them on. I got this one car done, carefully aligning each bit of decal with the rest. One of the end numbers broke into about eight different pieces. I consulted the AccuRail website. It says if this happens to brush liquid decal film onto the entire decal sheet before cutting out the individual numbers. So I ordered some microscale liquid decal film. So much for the hopper project. I spent the next few days building a turnout for Basin the only one I still needed to do. By the 16th, I had enough stamina to work on the layout for a bit longer than 15 minutes at a time, so I started laying the sidings in Basin. 
I finished the passing siding on the 17th, and on the 18th I laid the industry siding. On the 19th and 20th, I wired in the new tracks. About this same time, I spent a few hours at the computer detailing out the Grable benchwork. As soon as I'm able, I'm going to start installing that on the stairwell. Even though I'm a few weeks away from being physically able to install the Grable benchwork, I started prepping the space. These tall shelves had to go. It was now over two weeks since my surgery, and I felt good enough that I thought if I was careful, I could manage this. So being sure to avoid lifting too much or twisting the wrong way, I slowly emptied the shelves and broke them down, putting them underneath the Wind River Canyon Peninsula in several sections. I'd work for 10 or 15 minutes, then take a break. By the end of the day, I was pretty exhausted, but the Grable wall now looked like this. Remember back in very early December when I got an AnyCubic 3D resin printer as an early Christmas present? Well, after leaving it set for a few weeks with no activity, in late January I decided it was time to get started again. I could do this sitting down, after all. I created a test sample oil drilling pipe rack using Tinkercad and made a model the 3D printer could build from. Results were not what I expected. All I got out of the printer were the supports that were supposed to hold the rack while it printed. No rack itself. So I tried something a little simpler. I created this simple model to print out four small wooden crates, and it worked, so I created another model with more crates of varying sizes, including a couple stacked on top of others. This print failed miserably. Half the crates didn't stick to their supports, and the ones that did came out horribly distorted and misshapen. At this point, I've managed to get four usable small crates for an investment of only several hundred dollars. Not very cost effective. But once I figure out why most of the prints are failing, I should be able to fix that and make all sorts of detail parts and switch ties for a fraction of what they would cost me to buy them. Let's get back to that set of hoppers. I got the liquid decal film and applied it to this sheet. Sure enough, I was able to then cut out the numbers and install them without them breaking up on me. But they sure don't look very good, do they? Well, maybe when I weather the cars, this won't be so noticeable. On January 29th, with all the decaling finished, I began applying weathering, starting with the Katy Sprung trucks. I painted the outside faces of the wheels with rust, without removing the wheels from the trucks, then applied a rust-colored wash to the side frames themselves. After that, I set up all the hopper bodies in preparation to paint the beds of the hoppers. There's only nine here because I put the first hopper back in the box while I was waiting for the decal film, then forgot to get it back out. I brushed gray Vallejo paint sparsely inside the hoppers to represent the scraped up sides and slope sheets where things would be scraping them and eroding away the paint. At the bottom center of this shot is a completed hopper which I did with the same gray paint and to which I then added an ample amount of rust-colored chalks. On the 30th, I painted all the weights, and on the 31st, I assembled the frames and attached them to the car bodies. On February 1st, I added trucks and couplers and set the string of hoppers on the track in Worland to await weathering. I haven't had a disaster on the layout for a while, so I guess I was about due. For weathering, first I apply a very thin wash of Model Master's Flat Black, thinned with a lot of alcohol. I had coated all the decals with microscale flat finish to protect them, and look what happened. Apparently, alcohol reacts with flat finishes, turning them white. This really sucks. Carefully scraping the top of the decal with an X-Acto blade removed a lot of the white, at least making the number readable. Looks like crap though, doesn't it? I sure miss Floquil paints. I was hoping to have the hoppers finished for this update, but I still have a couple layers of weathering to add, including all the chalks. So you'll get to see how this mess all turns out next month. 
So here we are. Mostly light work on the trains this past month, with a lot of failures, the 3D prints and the hoppers being the most prominent. Maybe February will be better. I sure hope so. So what's my prognosis after the surgery? Well, when they removed my kidney, they actually found two tumors, one that they knew about, the big one, and a smaller one that they hadn't seen. Pathology confirmed that the bigger tumor was clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which they categorized as phase 1b. There is no evidence that it had spread, but it was big enough that they didn't classify it as a phase 1a. The second tumor was also a kidney cancer, a different type. That was papillary renal cell carcinoma type 2. There's also no sign that that tumor had spread anywhere else. You know, in my entire family history, on both sides of my family, only two people, as far as I know, ever had cancer. Now here I am with three types. I guess it comes from having lived in New Jersey. So what does the future hold? Well, in July and periodically thereafter, I'll undergo a CT scan to look for any spread of the tumors that they remove. They don't expect to find any, but sometimes they do pop up a few years later. I want to take a moment and thank everybody for their best wishes and their prayers. I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching, everyone. Stay healthy. Stay safe, and I'll see you next month.